Hey everybody, Russ Barkley here. Welcome to the new studio. I finally got it finished in our new home. Uh, also upgraded my equipment. Thank you very much to some of the subscribers who suggested I was in need of uh, a new microphone. So uh, yes, we've got a nice blue Yeti sitting here today as well. So uh, this is the channel where baldness is my superpower. So I hope you'll enjoy this review of research uh, with this new superpower in mind. So just a joke there, don't take it too seriously. There was a study published uh, earlier this week that was in the mainstream media, at least on the internet, uh, and was picked up over at a website, as you see here, called Study Finds. This particular website reviewed the article uh, with the headline of Can Parents Prevent Their Kids From Developing ADHD? Interesting question. I would not have thought of that. But uh, this article and the journalist who wrote it, John Ander, uh, goes through the study and then concludes that because certain types of parental behavior were predictive or not of whether children went on to develop ADHD in a longitudinal study, uh, whether they had symptoms of ADHD or full disorder, whether that was related to A, their temperament, B, their parenting, C, their executive functioning, particularly in this case measured by their inhibitory control. So in this article, after reviewing the study itself and its methods, the author goes on, obviously with some help from one of the authors of the paper, to conclude that more directive parenting, which is not controlling but guides the child with verbal and physical cues, can help children develop self-regulatory skills and prevent their ADHD symptoms from increasing. So here we have a study that finds correlations between temperament, types of parenting, risk for ADHD, but then takes it a step further to do something that I've cautioned many of you on this channel many, many times not to do, to interpret a correlation as a cause. And in this case, they're interpreting the findings of the study to say that parenting has some causal influence on risk for developing ADHD. So that's the mainstream media's report. Let's go over and take a look at the study itself. It was published over in the journal Research on Child and Adolescent Psychopathology. It's a very nice journal. Used to write for it myself from time to time. And it's a study out of the University of Waterloo in Canada with the lead author Nicole Lorenzo, in which they followed, as we see here, a group of children, 291 children, from ages 3 to age 15. And during the preschool years, they assessed their temperament and classified children as whether they were exuberant or not. They also assessed the parenting of these children using ratings uh, and uh, other measures. So here then they go on to reassess the children at ages 5, 7, 9, 12, and 15. Very nice longitudinal study. Uh, I mean, this is expensive to do, folks, to be able to get these people to come back in over time. And across time, at ages 5 onward, they were looking at ADHD symptoms. They were also looking at executive functioning, specifically inhibitory control, not all of the executive functions. Uh, and they were looking at uh, parent-child dyads. Uh, so what did they conclude from the study? First of all, they found that ADHD symptoms increased with age from five to nine, and then stabilized, and then start to decrease from ages nine to 15. That's very typical of studies of ADHD symptoms in the general population. Remember, they're not classifying kids as clinically diagnosed as ADHD. They're just measuring the number of symptoms that were reported on their measures. They then went on to find in certain analyses that they did that the type of parenting mediated whether or not an exuberant temperament in the preschool years 
actually predicted increased ADHD symptoms over time. And specifically, they found that parenting that was less directive, less attentive, obviously less helpful to the children developing self-control, according to them, that that kind of parenting mediated whether or not early temperament exuberance led to later ADHD symptoms. So uh, an important finding in one sense, it's nice to see that they're measuring these various constructs, but a problem with the study, as with the trade media article, is that they then go on to conclude that parenting may have some causal role in risk for ADHD later on. And if you can change your parenting to become more directive, more guiding, more helpful, more attentive, they believe that that would reduce risk of ADHD later. I'm not so sure about that because once again, our old problem of interpreting correlations in some causal direction simply doesn't wash. There are just as compelling explanations for the correlation. Before I show you what those might be, let me go on and explain to you what exuberant temperament is. Childhood temperament is believed to be a set of components of personality that will go on to establish the kinds of personality an individual have. It's a way of characterizing a child's overall behavior, manner, uh, and patterns in behavioral development. One type of temperamental trait is exuberance, and it is an expression of how likely you are to approach novelty, to seek rewards. You're sort of a positive reinforcement, novelty-seeking individual who's active, who's sociable, who reacts to novelty positively rather than with fear and worry, uh, and who may be more sociable than others. A couple of studies here have found that children who are high in exuberance, this kind of expressive, active, engaging, reinforcement, novelty-seeking behavior, that these children tended to engage with unfamiliar people more, tended to be low in their inhibition, and in one study also increased their likelihood of having later problems with disruptive behavior. So early exuberant temperament could be a precursor for later ADHD and other externalizing and even internalizing disorders like, say, anxiety and depression. So that's what exuberance means. And so the study, back to that for a moment, is showing that children who by age three were active, sociable, curious, novelty-seeking, reward-seeking, exploring their environment, had low inhibition, also were uh, less likely to be fearful and anxious, that that group of children went on to have a risk for ADHD later across time, but that risk appeared to be mediated, that is determined to some extent, by the quality, the kind of parenting. And of course, as I've said, they go on to interpret that as a reason to believe that parenting might uh, help to either cause or prevent later ADHD. All right, that said, now let me show you another possibility here. Here is a study published just last week, and it is looking at the intergenerational transmission of ADHD behaviors, and it is looking at genetics and environmental pathways. This is a big study out of Norway that is following 22,000 plus parents along with over 11,000 of their children in which the mothers, fathers, and children are genotyped for ADHD risk genes, in which they're measuring parental behavior, in which they're assessing child uh, ADHD and adult ADHD in the parents, and then over time, they're looking at what is determining the child's ADHD uh, as the child grows up. And here's what this study found, that the majority of the variation in children's ADHD behavior, 57% of the variation was heritable. It was due to genetic factors 
in the parent and the child. After controlling for that, they found that only 2%, 2% of the variation in ADHD behaviors could be attributed to the parent's ADHD behaviors, the effect that their ADHD had on parenting. That might have had a very tiny influence on children's ADHD symptoms, but the vast majority of the variation was explained by genetic factors. Now, this isn't a twin study. It's a different way of calculating heritability because they can actually look at the transmission of genes and traits from parents to children. If this were a twin study, as you know from my earlier videos, the genetic contribution to ADHD measured in twin studies is about 70 to 80 percent on average, meaning 70 to 80 percent of the differences among people in the population in their level of ADHD symptoms is related to their genetics. Now, why would twin studies be somewhat higher in heritability than this study? Because this study can't assess all of the genes that may be contributing to ADHD from parent to child. It only assesses what we know to be genetic factors, but we don't know all the genes for ADHD. We know, in fact, only a very small percentage of them. And so it's no surprise that this paper would find a somewhat lower degree of heritability, whereas twin studies, by the way that they're done and analyzed, can give us a more complete picture of how much genes, known and unknown, are contributing to a trait, in this case, ADHD, and they find that it's much higher. But the important thing here is that the parental behavior that looked like it might be influencing the child was in fact a reflection of the parent's ADHD and genetics. And the risk of ADHD to the child was a genetic risk, not a risk as a result of parenting. So this study would suggest that the earlier study we just talked about should not be interpreting parenting as a causal variable in the transmission of ADHD to a child. Notice that the earlier study did not assess parents at all for their ADHD. It only looked at the children over time. It didn't measure genetics. It didn't measure parental ADHD symptoms or behavior. So it can't say anything about how much of the findings could have been attributed to genetics. But this study that we're looking at now, the big one from Norway, can. And it's telling us to be careful about what we say about parenting when differences in parenting could simply be a reflection of differences in parental level of ADHD. And we know from studies of parents who have ADHD that they are less attentive, less rewarding, less directive and guiding, less helpful because of their own symptoms interfering with their parenting. So to sum it up, I think the interpretation of the study from Waterloo, Canada on temperament, parenting, and ADHD has probably been misinterpreted. Certainly there should have been some degree of caution in over-interpreting these correlations. And certainly the reporter who reported on that study in the trade media uh, also should have been more cautious because they concluded, even in their headline, that parenting might be able to change the risk for later ADHD. Uh, let's conclude with a PowerPoint here that I have for you. And let me just get it teed up here and active. And let's have a look, okay? I've tried to increase the size of my cursor a little bit, uh, but we'll see if uh, that shows up on your screen. I'm gonna also use a highlighter here. Okay, so we have in this study, if we can get this thing going here, hold on, all right. Okay, good, we got that. Okay, <clears throat> so we have exuberant temperament in the child, okay, measured in that Canadian study, and we have less directive parenting and less attention and guidance to the child. That study is concluding that these two are predicting later risk for 
ADHD symptoms. Indeed, it's saying that this early risk here that you see of exuberant temperament leading to ADHD symptoms later is entirely mediated by whether or not the parents showed this pattern of less directive parenting. Uh, and that's what led them to believe that it's really parenting that could be the, the moderator here, the mediator of this relationship. Maybe. Here's another possibility, a very real possibility given that Norwegian study. Parents with ADHD have disrupted parenting, usually, as I said, less attention, less direction, less reinforcement, more emotion, more variable parenting. We know that. But it's the parent's genetics that are leading to, A, early exuberant temperament, which is a proxy for early ADHD in young children. We know that early temperament can predict later ADHD symptoms. And that it's not the combination of directive parenting with early exuberant temperament that's determining the later ADHD, as they concluded. It is, in fact, the parent's genetics. Because as the Norwegian study found, and as twin studies have found, 57% to 80% of the variation in child ADHD-like behavior including exuberant temperament, for instance, probably, is determined by genetic factors in the family, from the parents and in the children. Only 2% of the variation in ADHD symptoms is the result of parental behavior directly. All the rest of the risk for ADHD is not really mediated by parenting as that Norwegian study found. It is mediated by genetic factors. So, to conclude, it's not, hold on, mm -mm. it's not going to be parenting that's going to change the risk for ADHD. So we shouldn't be giving parents false hope that if you'll just change the way you behave, you can lower or even eliminate the risk of ADHD in your child, particularly if they have exuberant temperament. Uh, and instead, what we're really looking at here is family genetics, parental ADHD, determining whether or not the child is going to have ADHD and the severity of their ADHD. And the parenting is just a mediator, if you will, not a mediator, but a proxy, a marker for the parent's ADHD. Okay. So there you have it. I hope you learned something from this. Number one, don't interpret correlations as causes. Number two, right? look across other studies to see if their findings are in agreement with the initial paper. In this case, we found a study that did use genetic factors as well as measures of parenting, and it helps us to interpret the earlier paper differently than the authors or the journalist interpreted it. So uh, I hope you learned something there. This also tells us something about the causes of ADHD from the environment, not just parenting, but stress, uh, perhaps trauma, other things, that it's really more a marker of what is going on in family genetics than it is as much a cause of later ADHD. So uh, thanks for joining me here on my YouTube channel. Uh, again, if you like what you're seeing, please subscribe. And I appreciate, again, subscribers who encourage me to up my game and get a new microphone and get the bed out of the background. Uh, I was, must have been making you sleepy or something. And to uh, improve these videos as best as I can. And that's what we're trying to do here. Thanks, everybody. Nice seeing you this week. I'll see you later this week with my research review. Be well.